The house is in silence. You wake up to hear the sound of someone crying outside of your room. You get out of bed and open the door to follow the sound. You look out of the window and see a woman wearing a long white dress walking across the lawn towards the trees. You go downstairs and go outside. You walk up beyond the woman and ask her if she's okay. She turns to face you. As her head turns, she has no face, just a dark cavity. Welcome to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. I'm your host, Clem Dalloway, and this episode is about Salmsbury Hall, near Preston, in Lancashire. A beautiful timber-framed Tudor manor house, with an interesting history and some ancient ghost stories. But first of all, I'd like to introduce you to another podcast. Let Me Tell You a Scary Story is a paranormal podcast hosted by Anna Rose, who reads out true-life creepy stories every Friday. These stories have happened to ordinary people all over the world and simply cannot be explained. They range from ghostly hauntings, glitch in the matrix tales, unexplained time lapses, alien sightings, possession, near misses, demons, doppelgangers, stalkers, true crime and much more. Not only this, Anna is an award-winning voiceover artist and is sure to hook you in with their excellent smooth storytelling voice. So close the blinds, turn off the lights, snuggle under that quilt and enjoy. Let me tell you a scary story found on any podcast listing platform. Salmsbury Hall lies six miles east of Preston in Lancashire, England. The manor of Salmsbury belonged to the De Iwas family until Gilbert de Southworth of Warrington acquired half of the manor through his marriage to Alice de Iwas. It's believed that Gilbert built Salmsbury Hall in 1325 in place of a previous building that was destroyed by the Scots after the Great Raid of 1322 where all buildings near to the River Ribble were set alight. In 1546, after the death of Thomas Southworth, the house was passed on to his son John, who was a devout Catholic. John got into a lot of trouble after he became part of a plot to overthrow Elizabeth I and replace her with the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots. John and his family refused to go to worship at the Protestant church and was constantly being fined. Towards the end of Sir John's life, Salmsbury Hall was raided by Richard Bretherton, a local justice of the peace. Among the superstitious items that he found, he discovered papist books, two candlesticks, an altar canopy and 14 religious images all objects that could be used in mass. These could have been hidden in one of the three priest holes that are in the house. Later in the 16th century, John's son, Thomas, converted to Church of England. In 1612, Jane Southworth, the wife of John Southworth, son of Thomas, was accused of witchcraft along with two other women. Janet Peerley and her daughter-in-law, Ellen. Originally, there were 11 people accused, but the other eight were freed on the order of the judge, Sir Edward Bromley. He told them that they were fortunate to escape and that they were all required to provide securities against their future conduct. They were accused by Grace Sowerbutts the teenage granddaughter of Janet Beerley. Jane's husband, John, was heir to the estate and had recently died. His uncle, Christopher Southworth, 
was a priest in the Church of Rome. At that time, a dangerous profession. Christopher objected to Jane as she refused to change her faith and remained as Protestant. It's believed that Grace Salbutz was sent to Christopher to learn her prayers and that he saw an opportunity to influence Grace to accuse them of witchcraft. The three women were accused of murdering a 12-month-old baby and after its burial, exhuming the body from Salmsbury churchyard, cooking it and eating it, but they saved the fat to apply to their bodies to change their appearance. Grace also said that they often abused her. During the trial, other witnesses claimed that Jane's father-in-law, Sir John Salforth, had said that Jane was a witch and was terrified of her, even to the point that he would avoid her house when passing near. Even though John had died 17 years previous to the trials, when Jane was still a young girl. When Janet was questioned, she told the court that she believed that Grace was taught to say these accusations by the priest who was teaching her, as they were all members of the congregation at the local Protestant church in Salisbury. Other witnesses started to argue and accuse each other, and it started getting out of hand. Finally, the three defendants were allowed to speak out to the judge. They asked for Grace to tell the judge what she'd witnessed in her own words, in which she struggled. It was then obvious to Sir Bromley that a Jesuit priest had been involved in influencing Grace. Grace then admitted that she was told to do it by Christopher Salforth. The three women were found to be innocent Another John Southworth, believed to be another grandson of Sir John, was trained as a priest in France, and after his training, he was sent back to England to help persuade the heretic Protestants back into the Catholic faith. He spent most of his working life in London and Westminster, and had spent time in prison on several occasions. When Oliver Cromwell issued a warrant for the arrest of all known priests and nuns, John was one of the priests captured. He admitted to being a priest of the Roman Church and that he was breaking the law. He was hung, drawn and quartered at Tyburn on the 28th of June, 1654. His remains were stitched back together, embalmed and sent to France. His remains were kept in a chapel until the French Revolution when it was hidden. The body was rediscovered in 1927 when he was brought back to England and reinterred in Westminster Roman Catholic Cathedral. He was canonized in 1970. The descendants of Gilbert de Southworth held the manor until 1678, when Edward Southworth sold the property to Thomas Braddell. The Southworths became bankrupt after the Civil War, and the family had split between Catholicism and Protestant. Thomas Braddell leased the hall to a group of handloom weavers until 1830, when he turned the house into the Braddell Arms Inn. In 1850, the house was sold on again to John Cooper, who leased the property to Mary Ann Harrison, who opened it up as a boarding school. The house was sold again in November 1862 to a prominent industrialist from Blackburn called Joseph Harrison. Joseph renovated the house and made it into a home again. In January 1879, Joseph's son, William, fell over on ice, seriously injuring his brain and one leg. This caused William to suffer with severe depression. Later in that year, William took his own life, shooting himself in the head while in the long gallery. Apparently the bullet is still lodged in the wall above the mantelpiece.
A year later, in 1880, Joseph Harrison died and the house was passed on to his youngest son, Henry Harrison, the mayor of Blackburn. Henry didn't live in the house and rented it out to Frederick Baines, who lived there for a number of years. After the death of Henry in 1914, the estate was passed on to his nephew. The hall stood empty from 1909 until it was bought by a building company in 1924 who intended to demolish the house and replace it with a housing estate. The local people gathered together and raised enough money to buy the house and restore it. This was the start of the Salmsbury Trust who have managed the house since. One day in the 1990s, an old lady visited the house and showed a tour guide a photo of herself standing in front of the fireplace when she was based in the area while in the RAF during World War II. She went on to tell the guide her story. The house was undergoing restoration after the Salmsbury Trust took over. A specialist builder was brought in to restore parts of the house to how they would have been when the house was built. He was up a ladder inspecting the joists in the long gallery when he found a stone that had eroded. As he moved the stone, it fell onto the floor. He turned on the ladder to face the direction of the falling stone and there was a little boy standing at the foot of the ladder. The builder shouted, look out, but the boy just stood there as the stone passed him. The boy shouted, You shouldn't be here. Mr. Harrison wouldn't like it. The builder told him that he should stand back as he could be injured. He climbed back up the ladder. When he looked down, the little boy had gone. In that same year, in the winter, a heavy snowstorm hit the area and the builder and his labourers had to stay overnight in the house. The labourers settled down in front of the fire and the builder set up his bed over the other side of the room. The labourers were asleep and he lay down to rest when he noticed a golden light coming from the doorway. The light was getting brighter and he sat up to see what was going on. When suddenly, a woman walked out of the light, who he described as beautiful and wearing a Georgian-style dress. She walked across the room towards him and went straight through him. She carried on towards the fireplace and then stood still. He heard her saying, I hope my husband survives this war. She then disappeared. He went and sat down to get over the shock of what he'd just seen. And then another golden light started to shine brightly in the doorway. This time, a man walked out of the light and walked across the room towards the fireplace. He was dressed like a cavalier from around the time of the English Civil War. He stood still and the builder heard him speak. He said, I hope I survive this war. He then disappeared, leaving a distinct smell of tobacco and leather. He then saw another bright light from the doorway. And this time, it was the little boy who he'd seen a few months before walk out. He walked across the room and went straight through the wall. He didn't tell anyone about this experience for 20 years. He was walking past the house one day when he noticed a military vehicle parked outside. He walked into the house and saw a man and a woman dressed in Royal Air Force uniform standing in front of the fireplace. He looked at the woman and just stared at her with a look of shock upon his face. She asked him if she could help him and he stood still and silent. When the man asked him the same, he said that he recognised the woman. He then went on to tell them that she looked exactly like the ghost that he'd seen 20 years ago. The woman told him that she didn't disbelieve what he'd seen, 
but she wasn't from the area and that she was from Leicestershire and would have been a small child 20 years ago. She went on to tell him that she'd felt an attraction to the house as if she'd been there before. They believed it to be the reincarnation of the woman in the Georgian dress. This lady was the woman in the photo. Many people have witnessed the ghost of a lady dressed in a long white dress in and around the house. She is believed to be the daughter of Sir John Southworth, Dorothy, who would have lived in the house in the 16th century. The story tells that she fell in love with a member of the de Houghton family from nearby Houghton Towers. They had to meet in secret as she was from a Catholic family and the de Houghtons were Protestant. One night she snuck out of the house and met the young man between two trees. She was followed by her brothers who pulled them apart and murdered him. Dorothy was sent to a convent in France and in protest starved herself. She died weeks later. In the 1920s, three skeletons were discovered just outside of the moat. It's unsure if there is a connection between the story and the bodies, but local legend says that one of the bodies was wearing a ring with an inscription saying to Houghton. In 1878, Lieutenant Colonel John Paulina was staying at the house as a guest of the Harrison family. After he'd gone to bed, he was woken in the night to the sound of a woman sobbing. He got out of bed to investigate and followed the sound. He entered the long gallery and looked out of the window and saw a lady dressed in a long white dress walking towards the two trees. He went outside and approached her from behind. She turned around to face him and she had no face, just a dark cavity. When he woke up the next morning, he told the Harrisons what he had witnessed. They just replied with, that's just the white lady. She's been here much longer than we have. During the 1980s, Two ladies who had recently retired had a day out to visit the house. They followed the tour guide who told them the history of the building. While they were in the main hall, one of the ladies commented on the wonderful medieval costume that one of the other guides was wearing. The tour guide said that no one was in costume today and asked where she was. She pointed to the doorway that led outside and said she'd just gone through there. They all went through the doorway and there was no one to be seen. There's a priest hole in the long gallery that was used to hide priests during the Reformation. It's unsure how true this story is, but it says that in 1624, a priest arrived at the house who needed shelter and the family let him in. What no one realized was that he was followed by soldiers. They burst into the house and found him as he was entering the priest hall. As he entered the room, they beheaded him at sight, covering the floor with blood. The family was sent to the Tower of London and stripped of their assets. When the Braddle family bought the house, they found the blood-stained floorboards and scrubbed them, but the stains wouldn't go. They eventually bricked up the room. In 1889, when the Baines family lived in the house, they decided to remove the bricks and open up the room. They found the blood-stained floor and had it scrubbed, and the stains wouldn't leave. Even when they replaced the floorboards, the stains came back. Thank you for listening to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. If you enjoy this channel, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up. It's very appreciated. You can find more information about episodes on the website www.ghosttales.co.uk I have a Facebook page facebook.com Ghost Tales Podcast 
and Instagram at Ghost Tales Podcast. This podcast is out monthly and is available on most podcast platforms. All music, research, writing, production, art and sound effects are all my own work. (laughs) 